Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Um, again, uh, I tried, obviously, on the first on the first talk, not so successfully, but I tried in your handout to give you all the specific citations and um, hard data so that you could listen to what's being said rather than trying to scribble down everything. Uh, when I've not been successful, please let me know and we'll go from there. My late great friend, Marion Hemperley, who was the Deputy Surveyor General of Georgia, said that if you really want to know the history of Georgia, you need to study the land records. The land records take you back to everything. And uh, that he's right about that to a large degree, but it, the land records can be complicated. There is a very good book for understanding Georgia land records. It was written for the formal scholar, not for someone researching their family history. For that, I would recommend uh, the Georgia research book that we talked about earlier. But for the technical history, uh, the hard history of it, I recommend Ferris Cadle's Georgia Land Surveying History and Law, which is cited in your handout. Okay, now um, also many of Georgia's early land records are have been scanned onto the Georgia Archives virtual vault, which is open, free to the public, et cetera. And I also published a book called The Early Settlers of Georgia, list of file headings of loose head right and bounty land grant files in the Georgia Department of Archives and History. And many of those loose records are being um, scan, have been scanned or are being scanned onto the virtual vault. All right, what we today call Georgia had organized government organizations over centuries. These included the French, the Spanish, even the Native American tribes had sophisticated political organizations, but none of them gave land grants in what is today Georgia. The first land to be granted, that is land that was granted from a government to private citizens or corporations. That begins after February 11th, 1733, which is Georgia Day, the birthday of the founding of the English colony of Georgia. Okay, now to keep things from getting too complicated, as I, I explained to you what a land grant is, a land grant is not a deed. Land can be transferred by deeds and by mortgages, by deed of gift, by all sorts of means. But a land grant, as we'll be talking about it today, is the initial transfer of the land from the government to the individual and the corporation. Uh, you can, however, sometimes find a land grant or a plat recorded in the county deed books for whatever reason. Somebody wanted to assure everyone that he did own the land by right of grant and so recorded it in the deed book. I had a good friend many years ago named Herb Robertson of Augusta, and he was a land title attorney. And he had a family in Augusta who um, were planning to sell some of their farmland. And he was going to do the title search for them. And he said, do you have any papers? And they said, well, yeah, we've got one piece of paper, but that's all we've got. So Herb really was disappointed. They brought it in. It was a royal land grant from Governor James Wright to their ancestor for the land. Heard said that was the easiest title trace he ever did. Okay, so it, it can happen, it can happen. Now, every state in the United States granted land by one of two means. Either the individual state granted the land, which includes the colonial lands that preceded the state, or the United States government granted the land. There are federal land states and not federal land states. Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina are not federal land states. The lands were granted by the individual governments within those states. Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, they are federal land states. The federal government granted their land although you will find copies of their respective federal land records in their respective state archives. Texas and Hawaii are strange situations, not to throw off on either of them, but uh, they also 
of land granted by their states, not by the federal government. They are not, Texas and Hawaii are also not federal land states. And there may be another state or two out there somewhere that I'm not familiar with. But the original 13 states and the states that were created from them were all individual non-federal land states. Okay, now, in Georgia, land was granted by the King of England from 1733 to 1776, and it was granted by the state of Georgia from 1783 to 1906. And uh, after that, it was left up to the individual counties if they found some land that somehow had not been granted. It would land automatically transferred to the state of Georgia. From 1733 until 1752, the state of Georgia was governed by a nonprofit board of trustees, uh, non civi civialis, the uh, here's the Georgia trustees entertaining guests from Georgia. Okay, the uh, Georgia. Uh, Georgia was ruled by a board of trustees. The trustees governed, every, the idea behind Georgia was to give people in the middle class in England who had fallen on hard times a second chance. These included debtors and other such individuals. If you went to Georgia, your life was ran by the trustees in England. You couldn't have rum, you couldn't have lawyers. You did not own land. The trustees owned the land. They allotted you land. And when you died, they decided what happened to the land. This way you couldn't mortgage the land and get back into debt trouble and things of this sort. However, in 1752, the trustees gave up their colony to the crown and Georgia became an English royal colony with land granting lawyers rum, all the good things Georgians had been cheated out of before. Now, the records of the allotments made by the trustees is a confused mess. And most of these are lists of grants with no information given as to the documentation behind it. In your handout, there are a list of printed sources that will um, explain this to you. Uh, I will show you what they were. In 1754, Georgia really becomes a royal colony when the royal governor arrives. And from 1755 on, he and then later the state, the governors, the royal governors, and then the state governors will be granting land from 1755 on. Now, um, on this, and technically the land still belonged to the king. Officially, it belonged to the person who received the grant. Now, uh, there's a tremendous amount of personal information in these. Because in order to get a grant from the colonial governor of Georgia, you had to show up on Land Tuesday. You had to explain how long you had lived in Georgia, why you qualified for a grant, and where you wanted the land. And then the governor and the council would agree to let you have the grant or not. But they would insist that you first had the land surveyed so that the land really, everybody knew the land really existed. And then you would come back with your survey and you would get the grant. And the governor and council could turn you down for any number of reasons, including they didn't like you or you smell bad or whatever. I mean, they were completely free to be as arbitrary in it as they chose to be. Uh, also, they set some pretty strict regular re restrictions. You could only receive this free land. This was called head right. You could only receive the free land based on the size of the number of people in your household. That is you, your wife, your children, your servants, your enslaved people, whatever. Now you're saying, what is the exact formula for doing this so you can figure out how your family ancestors household? You can't do it that way because nobody ever asked for all the land they were entitled to. The reason being, you never knew when you were going to climb over a hill and find some ungranted land you liked better. So you never wanted to use up all of your head rights. And they never broke it down like we're giving you 100 acres for just you. And this time we're giving you 50 acres for your child or whatever. So, but anyway, the personal information, the personal information from the Georgia land grants and plats were published by Mary Warren in her books, Georgia Governor and Council Journals, copies of which are here in this library and they're listed in your handout. 
list in your handout. Most of the most of the colonial grants, there's a few in the last days of the Ameri last days of colonial Georgia that do not survive, but most of the colonial grants survive. Most of the surveys that were handed in for the grants do not survive. They do not survive, unfortunately. Um, they sort of disappeared at the end of the American Revolution with the British evacuation. Daniel Crumpton, C-R-U-M-P-T-O-N, has published books where he's taken the existing plaques and pieced piece them together like puzzle pieces. And he has done this for Burke, Jefferson, Richmond, Warren, and Wilkes counties. And those books are very helpful. Now, Dan's books have mistakes, but that's not really his fault. Anybody who tried, first thing I ever did 50 years ago for the state of Georgia was try to piece the grants together around the Kettle Creek battlefield. And that improved, that proved to be critically important to what I was doing, to the project I was doing. But you make mistakes because some of the surveyors were dishonest. There were mistakes made in the surveys. Not all the surveys survive. And like I said, it's it's like working on a puzzle piece where not all the pieces are right and some of the pieces are missing. But be that as it may, be that as it may. All right, now, uh, after the state of Georgia, oh, by the way, all the land grant records for Georgia that are known to survive are here at the Georgia archives. All right, now, uh, let's talk about some of the related records, if you would, some of the related records too. If you find a surviving plat or survey, and it has the letter CC colon, followed by two names, can you tell me what CC colon means on a plat or survey? Do what, ma'am? Chain carriers. Chain carriers. All right. You want the state of Georgia or the colony of Georgia to grant you a piece of land. All right. They're going to insist that you have it surveyed first. So the surveyor comes to your cabin. You are expected to give the surveyor three things. Lunch, his fee, and two chain carriers. And the two chain carriers did exactly that. They carried the chains. No thinking involved. They just carried the chains to where the surveyor told them to carry the chains. And you pick the two people as your chain carriers who are the two people you trusted most in the world because you needed people who were willing to lie for you in land court and say, well, no, we didn't see the hash marks on the tree. No, we have no idea how the rock crossed the road or, <laughs> you know, uh, how this, uh, no, we had no idea that this land had already been granted to someone else, that sort of thing. And of course, the two people you trusted most in the world were most likely going to be your close relatives. Now, that's one of the bad things about, about land grant records and also military records. It's only se very seldom they actually give you a personal relationship. Where land grant records are great is um, they put your ancestor in a place, in a time. And that can be the keys to the kingdom. And sometimes when you look at the neighbors on a grant or a plat, when you look at the names of the chain carriers, then these names are suspiciously common and you suspect there may be relatives. Like for example, your ancestor's last name was Hollingsworth and then all the people who have lands granted around him are last named Hollingsworth. That's circumstantial evidence, except in Hall County, Georgia, where that doesn't mean anything. In Hall County, we have at least five of every family and they're never related to each other like the Rogers family, for example. And even when, the, like in the case of the Rogers family, you have five Rogers family. I personally believe they all lived in the same cabin and were no kin to each other, but be that as it may. Okay, now I'll relate other related records to this. When the state of Georgia, now in colonial times, the land court was a governor and council meeting on the first Tuesday of the month. After the state of Georgia began granting lands in 1783, the land court was held in each county. And the Georgia archives has land court records for some counties, a handful of counties, not many of them. These include Franklin, Richmond, Wilkes, and some others. Unfortunately, most of these records have never been published, but they can be a gold mine. 
I'd like to claim 500 acres that belong to my brother, John Dooley, who was murdered by the Tories. Or I'd like to claim 200 acres that was first surveyed for my father-in-law, so-and-so. And things like that, you know, or I'd like 500 acres next to my first cousin. Well, no, you're never going to see that. Next to uh, my uh, widowed mother, so-and-so. Things like that. This shows up in the land court minutes, but it doesn't show up in the plat. It doesn't show up in the grant. Um, the Augusta Genealogical Society is planning to publish the Wilkes County, Georgia land court minutes, though, um, when uh, they can get some a grant from the Taylor Foundation. But anyway, the land court minute records as well. And at the Georgia Archives, as I said, we have loose head right and bounty grant files which have loose surveys of related records. And sometimes in the loose files, you will find where somebody actually had land surveyed and never had the grant taken out. And that can be valuable information. And occasionally somebody will have doodled on the surveys and such, and those can be absolutely adorable. Uh, it was interesting in for the la later land lotteries in the Cherokee lands, sometimes the mansions that the Cherokees owned were drawn on the plats which is interesting, particularly since some of those houses still exist. And we thus have a drawing of them. All right, now we've talked about the head right land grants, which was most of the land that was granted in Georgia before the American Revolution. There was one huge exception, however, sort of. Land was on the North in 1773, land was taken from the Indians by treaty on the northwest frontier of Georgia. This is today Wilkes and surrounding counties. This was called the ceded lands. None of the lands in the ceded lands was ever granted before the American Revolution. However, this land was not given away free, it was sold. So the families who settled in this land in 1773, 1774, they had to make payments. A record book of their payments survives. This is called the ceded lands journal. A man named James LeConte transcribed the journal before it fell to pieces. The Georgia Archives has the pieces right now, um, but does not allow the public access to them because they're in such fragile shape. Now, uh, we have the LeConte transcript here. The LeConte transcript was published by Grace Davidson in early records of Georgia, Wilkes County, but Ms. Davidson left out all records of slavery. She thought that might be an embarrassment to the families. And most people who have used that journal over the years were oblivious to that omission. So use the LeConte transcript. The Georgia Genealogical Society has transcribed the LeConte transcript and it's on their website. It's on their website for their, for their members. Now, the beauty of this is when you pay, made your payment, you had to identify who you are. My name is Elijah Clark. And I come here from Anson County, North Carolina, and I have a wife and I have four children and we would like 150 acres on what I modestly am now calling Clark's Creek in Wilkes County. Hello, my name is John Dooley. I'm here with my wife, my three, ne my three nephews and uh, my three children and my three Negro, uh, my three sons and my three I'm here with my wife, my three nephews, my three Negroes. Okay, people wondered at that when they read it in Davidson. I mean, they read it in Lacan. Did he? Uh, did he really mean? I mean, I'm here with my three sons and my three Negroes, and people thought that he really meant three nephews. But no, you go. I looked. I've looked at the original document. No, it was three Negroes. Lacan was right on the money. So. The Lacan transcript is a better document to use. But anyway, you find out where these first settlers of Wilkes County came from, and you find out uh, their family size and other good information. Wilkes and surrounding counties in 1790 will have 40% of Georgia's population. It's largest population of free black people in Georgia. In fact, half of Georgia's free black people. And it is from Wilkes County that more families have moved than anywhere else. I mean, if you go down to Effingham County where the Salzburgers live, the Salzburgers still live there. You look in the phone books, 
And you look at the 1730s books on the Salzburgers, it's the same families. General Oglethorpe still told them to stay there until he came back, and Oglethorpe never came back. Uh, my old friend Gordon Smith in Savannah, he said if he wanted to do his family tree, he would go out to uh, all of the cemeteries, and he said his family tree was all, family were all buried there, as is he now. He said he just wished that they could have been buried in family chart formation <laughs> to make it a little easier. Um, but Savannah has wonderful cemetery records, by the way. All right, now, uh, anyway, the Wilkes County Records is a Seated Lands Journal, and I use the Lacan transcript, which is in the pamphlet collection here at the Georgia Archives, or Miss Davidson's trans publication, as long as you understand the enslaved people are left out of it. Okay, now, leaving colonial Georgia behind. Okay, uh, there were no land grants made in Georgia during the American Revolution. There is a book of payments that were made for lands in Georgia for 1775 and 1778, but no single grant or plat has ever been connected to anybody on those lists. And this list is in my book, A Researcher's Library of Georgia, Volume 1. Researcher's Library of Georgia 1. By the way, it also includes a list of cases where people appeared in land court and challenged someone's claim to land. These are called caveats. And those are also in volume one of my book, A Researcher's Library of Georgia. And that's not mentioned in the handout. Not mentioned in the handout. Okay, anyway, there was a list of payments that were made for land in Georgia in 1775 and 1778. And there is no record of any land grant or plat connected to those payments. And that record is here at the Georgia Archives as well. Starting in 1783, the state of Georgia opened a land office. The state of Georgia opened a land office. And what you did was you went to your county land office, you got a certificate from there, and then you went to land court, the governor in the land court, with your certificate, and they approved it because the land court had approved it. And you then you had a survey made, you brought the survey back, and the governor gave you a land grant. And we have all of those land grants here and all of the pl recorded plats. And we also have loose plats as well that for some reason are here, but there's no land grant attached to the plat associated with it. We have all of that here at the Georgia Archives. And the best place to begin on that is uh, Index to Headright and Bounty Land Grants of Georgia, Index to Headright and Bounty Land Grants of Georgia, which is cited in your handout. Now, uh, the Georgia headright system was always wrought with fraud. There was all, in any, con any land records you ever have, there's always going to be people trying to game the system. That's just the way things are. And it certainly was with the headright system. After 1783, however, this was done on a spectacular basis. All right, no one was allowed to have a land grant of more than 1,000 acres, a headright grant of more than 1,000 acres or land grant more than a thousand acres. However, you could show up at the governor's office with a land grant for 10,000 acres or 50,000 acres. The land grant could have no boundaries on it that anybody could recognize, mentions no neighbors of any sort. It could have been something you just made up and then paid a surveyor to sign his name to it. You could take it to the governor and for a little money, George Walton or George Matthews or any of these governors would make it an official grant. This was called the Pine Barrens land fraud. And this really got out of hand. Georgia had 8 million acres of land. We gave away 36 million acres of land. Uh, and there's still people who show up at Georgia courthouses with land grants for 100,000 acres in Montgomery County, Georgia. And they asked the clerk of court, can I see the family estate? And they said, sure, it's somewhere between Oz and Atlantis. Okay, anyway, we'll talk more about what the state of Georgia finally does about that later. Now, the state of Georgia also rewarded the state's Revolutionary War, also rewarded the state's Revolutionary War veterans with bounty lands. If you served in the Continental Army, you got a bounty, you got a certificate good for free land in Georgia. 
if you um, served in the state militia or the state Minutemen, you got free uh, a certificate for free land. If you were forced to flee Georgia when the British overran the state, but you continued the war in another state, you get free land a free land bounty certificate for being a ref refugee. And Georgia was such a terrible place to live in in the last 11 months of the war that we finally just gave people free land certificates. If you lived in Georgia for the last 11 months of the war and you didn't join the British or the Tories or the Indians, if you just stayed home peacefully and didn't hurt anybody. Now, problem with all of this is this was also wrought with fraud. How did you get a free, a free a certificate for free bounty land? You went to your local militia colonel and he certified your service, particularly Elijah Clark, but others as well. Uh, colonel Clark's certificates are somewhat suspect. There was a notorious band of loyalist provincials in Georgia, Thomas Brown's King's Rangers. And you compare the names of people that Clark certified for land and Thomas Brown's King's Rangers. And there's an eerie similarity between the names. In fact, there's an eerie similarity between a number of known Georgia loyalists, which implies that for a fee, Elijah Clark was willing to certify that you were a refugee or you were a, a militiaman or you served under him or whatever. Anyway, the system becomes such complete chaos that in 1786, the state of Georgia threw it out the window. Now, there's several good books that have been published on the bounty lands, but there is no complete book of these. Uh, Lucian Lamar Knight's Georgia's Roster of the American Revolution. It has lists of many of the names of the people getting bounty lands, but those certificates have since disappeared. So we don't know. And others are being found all the time. Check back issues of the Georgia Genealogical Society quarterly for that. And again, here on our handout. All right. Now, the head right and bounty land grants were made on the eastern fifth of Georgia. This is basically the Savannah River Valley and the Georgia coast. Yes, sir, we can do that. Uh, in fact, we need to move on about it. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, actually, I've got a better map here. Okay, this is what Colonial Georgia was. This is Colonial Georgia here. This is Colonial Georgia. And uh, the lands had to be surveyed. This was uh, from a private survey, and it's wonderful because it shows the houses and the barns and things of this sort. Okay, this is the ceded lands. This was the original Wilkes County and surrounding counties. Think of Washington County in about 50 miles in every direction. Okay. And this is a Georgia surveyor and on the crew. And here's a Georgia frontiersman right after the revolution hunting a deer and scared of Indians as shown here too. Okay, this is Daniel Crumpton's books on uh, Georgia, on where he's tried to piece together the Georgia surveys. This is his book on Wilkes County, which is two volumes and it's excellent. And this is where we talk about the bounty lands. I put the slide in here so everybody would laugh and nobody's, <laughs> okay. All right. Now, we'll show you a map of the Georgia land lottery areas in just a moment. Uh, now, so Georgia's greatest governor was James Jackson, a Revolutionary War veteran, and he put an end to the Pine Barrens fraud and the Yazoo land fraud, where the Georgia, a bribed Georgia legislature sold away Alabama and Mississippi to a bunch of corrupt land speculators, including Elijah Clark. <laughs> okay. Anyway, James Jackson passed a law that said from this time on, whenever the state of Georgia acquires land from the Indians, the land will be pre-surveyed in numbered land lots by district. And then the land lots will be given away by lottery to Georgia residents. No more of this head right stuff, no more of this uh, uh, bounty land stuff, no more of this phony lands that don't really exist, all this comes to an end. 
And believe it or not, there are a lot of Georgians who were angry at this. They thought the system was just fine the way it was, if you wanted to call it a system. All right, so, uh, but anyway, the act is passed, but it's years before Georgia acquires more land from the Indians. And the first of this land is in East Central Georgia. And this land was granted by a system called the, the 1805 Land Lottery. Now, Georgia granted land in 1805, 1800, under land lottery, 1805, 1807, 1820, 1821, 1827, 1832. And then they had a special lottery in 1833 for land grants that for what land lots that for whatever reason had not been granted before. And uh, modesty forbids me from mentioning that I was the one who discovered those records. I'm the only living person who ever found the Georgia land lottery. Anyway, your handout goes into these lotteries in great detail, in great detail. In the original 1805 land lottery, if you were a Georgia taxpayer and you were the head of a household, which usually meant the husband or a single man, then you received, you got a chance in the land lottery. If you were a widow, you had a chance in the lottery. Uh, in 1807, we also extended this to single women who were heads of household. But uh, a certain class of professional women took advantage of that, and that came to an end rather abruptly. Now, only the 1805 land lottery do we have a list of everyone who registered for it. Now, for the 1805 and the 1807 land lotteries, the very best books were those that were published by Paul K. Graham. Paul Graham. His 1805 land lottery book, which is in two volumes, and his 1807 land lottery book. They're excellent and they're very well done. The earlier books leave out names, misspelled names. They have issues. But uh, Paul did a first class job on those. I wish he would do the rest of the lotteries. Now, for the later lotteries, for the later lotteries, all sorts of you, the, the Georgia's legislature in those days was extremely liberal and really cared about the people of Georgia. So they were using the land lottery system as a sort of social safety net. If you were an orphan, you were entitled to a draw in the land lottery, or a family of orphans, you were entitled to a draw in the land lottery. If you were a widow, if you were mentally challenged, if you were blind, if you were deaf, and of course, they're not going to forget the veterans, no siree. Revolutionary War veterans, it didn't matter where you served as long as it was on the side that won, you were entitled to chances in the lottery. Your widow would be entitled to chances in the lottery. Uh, we had chances for the soldiers who served in the Oconee War that never took place. They, they and their widows got chances. Then there was the um, uh, late war with um, the British and the Indians, what we would call the War of 1812 they were entitled to chances in the lottery as well, and their widows. Anyway, it got so confusing that by the time county, by the time of the last lottery, the county clerk had this graph, you know, and you could, well, how many chances you could qualify for, depending on what you were, you know, uh, but be that as it may. Now, one question that has been asked to me dozens of times over the years, the land lottery records show that my grandfather received a chance in the land lottery because he was a Revolutionary War veteran. Where do I go for his service? There is no record of his service for purposes of, what you did was you showed up in front of the justice of the peace, you held up your arm and you said, I was a veteran of the American Revolution and I did not serve with the British, the Indians and the Tories. Oops. <laughs> and therefore I'm entitled to a chance, or my husband was or whatever. And the clerk, the justice of the peace was not required to have witnesses or a sworn statement or anything of the fact. Now, in the land lottery system, like in any other system, of course, there was fraud. And the uh, most common, one of the most common forms of fraud was to claim you're a Revolutionary War veteran when you weren't. Now, if you found that somebody won a land lot with a fraudulent claim, and you could prove it in the courthouse where the land lay, you got half of the land lot and the state of Georgia got the other half. And among the most common ones was 
he yes, he did serve in the American Revolution on the side of the British, the Tories, and the Indians. Okay, another one was he signed up as an orphan, the orphan of so and so, which is not true. Uh, first off, he's not so and so's orphan, and then secondly, his father is still living. Uh, and things that you could really talk about skeletons in the family tree. Anyway, there were th over 30 cases where of land lottery fraud that were proven. These are in my book, the Georgia Black Book, Morbid, Macabre, and Sometimes Disgusting Records of Genealogical Value. And yes, that is the name of the book. I'm not making a joke. Uh, it had, by the way, has a second volume, and some people are just itching for a third. Okay. Now, all the Georgia land lottery lists have been published. And since all of them were published by human beings, all of them have some mistakes and omissions. Like I said, for 1805 and 1807, the best are those by Paul Graham. The absolute worst publication of any land lottery was the 1827 land lottery. The book cannot be relied on in any way, shape, or form. When the lottery was taking place in 1827, the every day the winners were published. And then at the end of the drawings for the lottery, okay, here's the Georgia land lottery areas covered. In the in that land lottery, uh, at the end of the drawings of the land lottery, all the lists were published as a book. And all the publications of those lists since that time are based on that publication. And that publication omitted names, got numbers wrong, got names wrong. It's just one gigantic screwed up mess. But that's all that's been reprinted. Nobody ever went back to the original records here at the Georgia Archives and published the honest, the original from the original records. And so, like I say, if you find your ancestor won in the 1827 land lottery, look up the actual record to make sure you're get, you've got the correct information. Now, the 1832 Georgia land lottery was a little weird. Uh, gold had been discovered in the Cherokee Nation, which was the last of the 1832 lottery. And it just did not seem fair that everybody had an equal chance for the gold lots. Well, in that sense. So the land lots that looked like they might have gold on them, they were granted in one land lottery. And then for the Cherokee, for the rest of the Northwest Georgia was granted in another land lottery. And of course, gold was sometimes found in the Cherokee land lottery lots, and gold was not found on most of the lots in the gold lottery, but be that as it may. Um, and so this goes, but this was the 1832 Georgia gold, uh, gold and Cherokee lotteries. The two lotteries were held at the same time, were held at the same time. Now, most of the time, if, the Georgia, if a Georgia land lot was not up to prescribed size, instead of putting that in the lottery, the state of Georgia would sell that land lot for an auction. And some of the land lots that were not up to snuff were only like an acre and a half. And so the state did that. But for the 1832 land lottery, that seems so terribly unfair. So terribly unfair. So the land lots that were less than normal size, they took anybody who did not win in the Cherokee and gold lotteries and they held a special lottery in 1833 for these irregular land lots. So you might get one little acre that has a gold mine on it or something. And at the same time, there were other land lots that were found to be fraudulently granted in the lotteries, and they were taken back, and they were thrown, they threw them in the they threw them into the pot too and granted them. And this is published in the 1833 Georgia Land Lottery book, which is it, it was accurately done, I should know, because I published it. All right, now let's talk a little more about this. Now, the Georgia legislature has always been kind, gentle, and so naive, uh, <laughs> among other things, among other things. Now, uh, let's say you want a land lot, and you have a nice, comfortable farm in Burke County, Georgia, and the land lot that you want is in Carroll County, Georgia. Are you going to grab your wife and your nine children, sell off your land in Burke County, and go out into a howling wilderness like Carroll County, Georgia, and start over? No. no. What you're going to do is sell the land lot. 
you sold your land lot to land speculators who sold the land lot to newcomers. Folks, families from North Carolina and South Carolina who want to move to Georgia and start a new life, they will buy your land lot from you, which is not a bad deal. I mean, you get a few bucks, you know, the first lottery where somebody actually got some money in Georgia. I mean, not mega, like the mega lottery, but still. Okay, so most of the Georgia land lots were not, that went in the lotteries were not granted to the winners. I mean, were granted to the winners, but were not um, settled by the winners. The winners sold their land lots to newcomers coming in. And you find the deeds, for, you should find the deeds for this in the county where the land lays. Trouble with that, trouble with that, is that in, it's like the case of the 1805 and 1807 land lottery, there were no courthouses, so you could pretty much register the deed wherever you wanted to. And some people did that anyway for the later lotteries. So it, it can be a, a challenging sometimes to find the lot. However, it is worth checking to find the deeds where the land lot was sold. Your ancestor from Burke County wins a land lot in um, Carroll County, Georgia. Okay, uh, as that goes. Uh, but let's see. Wins the land lot in Carroll County, Georgia. Okay, he's. Um, however, when you check the Carroll County deeds, he didn't sell the land lot. His widow did. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that between when he registered for the land lottery and when she sold the land lot, he's de died. You find where the El orphans, the orphans of William Bandy of McIntosh County. McIntosh County's lost all of its records in an 1870s fire and an 1860s fire too, by the way, but it lost all of its records. But you find that the orphans of William Bandy won a land lot. You check the deed records and you find that the land was sold by Alan Bandy. Alan Bandy was the uncle of the orphans. And he explains that there were two orphans. He names who the orphans were. And he explains that the first orphan is dead and that he's selling the land lot on behalf of the younger, the other orphan who's his nephew. So what I'm trying to say is in the deeds, you can find family information. Now, the Georgia legislature was very generous, by the way, in, give, in giving time for getting your land. So the legislature gave you, the legislature gave you forever to take out a land grant until 1845. Then they finally had enough. And they said, here's the deal. If you do not, if you want a land lot and you don't claim it in the next six months, then the state of Georgia will sell the land lot at auction. And a lot of people never claim their land lots because the land lot wasn't worth what they could get for selling it, if they could get anything at all. This is particularly true of Southwest Georgia and Northwest Georgia. There was just a lot of land that was worthless, even today. Okay, now, the news reaches across Georgia. You've got six months to claim your land, your land grant in the land lottery. A lot of people show up in, in Milledgeville, the state capital, and they ask for the land that they won or their relative won. And uh, these are called the loose land lottery papers. And you can find the best stuff in there. You find widows who are claiming land that was won by their husbands. You find children who are claiming land that was won by their parents. You find uh, re uh, other relatives, all this family information. I went through the loose land lottery papers and where I found personal information, I published up in a book with the unimaginative title, The Georgia Land Lottery Papers. <laughs> and I later found more of these records at the University of Georgia and I published them in the um, Georgia Genealogical Society Quarterly, in the Georgia Genealogical Society Quarterly. Now, Paul Graham, I should mention, Paul Graham, in his books on the 1805 and the 1807 land lottery, if there are loose papers that survive on for these respective land grants, he published those in his book, in the books, except for those I later found at the University of Georgia, which are in the Georgia Genealogical Society quarterly. Okay, now, uh, as I say, we talked about, we've been talking about land grant records. 
but Georgia land records contain so much more. Our deed books contain deeds and mortgages, powers of attorney, even wills and land grants are found in Georgia's deed books. One trick, a couple of tricks about using Georgia deed books, however. First off, many of the deed books only index the deeds, only index. So if it's a mortgage or a power of attorney or a deed of gift, it doesn't show up in the index. Uh, yes, ma'am. That that may or may not show up in the index. Plus, the indexes were done by different clerks over the years and who were of different competencies. So sometimes it's not a bad idea to go through the uh, county's deed books for your ancestor page by page for the years they were living there. And you may find some, be very pleasantly surprised at what you find. Many, some Georgia counties, the deeds have been abstracted and published. The books on Franklin County by, Ms. Martha, by Martha Acker are first rate. The ones that were done by Michael Farmer, M-I-C-H-E-L Farmer, uh, for Wilkes and uh, several other northeastern Georgia counties, they are also excellent. And it's all and because the deed in the, the indexes, the, in the, the handwritten indexes to Georgia county deeds in Georgia are so bad, I always start with the published abstracts first because they're invariably going to be indexed so much better than what the county officials did. Sure. What is the relevancy of Wilkes County? In 1790, 40% of the people of Georgia lived in that one county. Wilkes County has almost every scrap of paper it's ever had, and we're still finding more and more is being published on it. It's just it, it, not, it's wonderful that it, all these people live there, but even more wonderful that their records survive. And again, this is the great migration center of Georgia. Other counties, people didn't leave as often. Wilkes County, almost all of them did for somewhere else. These were, and I'm mean, talk, talk, talking about the rest of Georgia, I'm talking about America. Uh, Grace Davidson used to have clients who lived in Avaii who would do uh, who uh, wrote to her. But this is today Wilkes and the surrounding counties. No, ma'am, uh, Gone with the Wind is where you're sitting right now. Well, actually, just a few miles down the road in Jonesboro. That was the setting of that Clayton County. Oh, yes, ma'am. Native Americans that were there and the movement West, they moved the movement West. Are these a lot of for example, they were saying, and I read a book, the Cherokee lawyers went to the Supreme Court, that's federal, this is state, and the Supreme Court said that they they couldn't, well, basically they couldn't do this. The Cherokee Indians, that was their land, they had a right and they could not be moved. Andrew Jackson, the president said, well, I don't care what the Supreme Court says, let them come down. All right, uh, the lady, the, okay, ma'am. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the lady is asking about the Cherokee removal and the Supreme Court decision that the Cherokees could not be removed. First off, that's one of the great myths of American history. It's pure nonsense. Uh, the Supreme Court said that it was illegal to remove the Indians, but it was also illegal for the Supreme Court to do anything to stop it, or the President of the United States to do anything to stop it. I did an article on that, a man named Burke did an article on it 50 years ago, and uh, I'll be happy to send you a copy of the article. But uh, anyway, it's nonsense. The Cherokees were offered land in North Georgia and citizenship if they agreed um, uh, in citizenship if they agreed to give up the rest of the land in Northwest Georgia. Neither the Cherokees or the whites liked that idea very much, and that was thrown out the window. This is called the Cherokee Reservees. Now, in the Georgia land lotteries, Indians and black people were not allowed chances in the land lottery. You had to be white, period. And uh, so any, but the 1832 the land lottery law of 32 said, if, you, if the land you won was occupied by an Indian, you could do absolutely nothing about claiming the land until the Indian left 
voluntarily, as in dragged away by the United States Army, was as that's voluntary counts as voluntary. And this was actually there was a conflict that one of my cousins, Reuben Harrison, uh, he won land in the Cherokee land lottery, and it was land occupied by a Cherokee who was claiming land as a Cherokee reservee. And this ended up in court and the Cherokee, of course, lost because the Congress never agreed to this and neither did the Supreme Court. But the point of the poor, point of the matter is the Cherokee Indians were screwed from day one and they never, uh, they had a fine lawyer, but they were, they, they were going to, they were going to go. And the sad thing about it is most of the land in Northwest Georgia ended up in the hands of a few big land speculators like Ferris Carter and uh, went undeveloped right into the 20th century as a result. And one, one missionary who returned, his name was Butler, he wrote home and he said, I can't believe this. Georgia went to all this trouble to remove the Indians from this land. And then they didn't settle it after removing the Indians. It's still a house it's a, where the Indians had farms and plantations. It's now a howling wilderness. And he couldn't, he, none of it made sense to him, but it was all political. Now, uh, on this, but as they say, deed records, deed records are a different ball game, but they're very, they, they can be very informative on personal information. Uh, also tax records. Georgia has wonderful tax records, particularly compared to Alabama, South Carolina, and other states. Uh, Georgia has a pretty much complete set of county tax records here at the archives from 1872 to the present. And it has many earlier tax records, and especially for the burned counties. In counties where the deed books were burned, the county officials went out of their way to save the county tax digest. Baldwin County being Jefferson County, counties like that. Yes, ma'am. Digest for that year, a lot of times the land lot was listed in the. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The designations given for the land lots are the same ones still used today. So if you found where your ancestor owned or won a land lot, you can actually go on a modern highway, Georgia highway map, and go right to the land lot and there see where your ancestor's fort used to stand is now a Walmart. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, and speculation still goes on there as ever before um, on that. Also, I should mention about Georgia's taxes. Adult males were required to pay a tax even if they owned no land and they owned no slaves, but adult, and men who were men who met the qualifications for serving in the involuntary militia, they had to pay a poll tax. In Georgia, the poll tax that really had nothing to do with voting. It had everything to do with being in the militia. So uh, Georgia tax records are often a census record. And my final thought, my final thought on this, I'll be around to answer more questions. My final thought on this, the land lottery records, the land grant records, um, the tax records, even the deed records are wonderful census substitutes. You find in the Georgia land lottery where your ancestor lived in different counties between the censuses and you never knew, you never knew that. And uh, but they show up there or you look in the tax records and you find your ancestor in the tax records where you don't find them in the census record. Uh, whole militia districts in what is today South Fulton County and what was uh, Carroll County, Georgia, went for years without being included in the census. In Gilmer County, Georgia, uh, uh, was it Gilmer County, Cherokee County, Northern Cherokee County, Georgia, not 15 minutes from Canton, the county seat. There is a valley there that had no census taken from 1920 until I went through in 1980. And so, like I said, these wonderful records will give you the keys to the kingdom. They'll show you where your family was when your family was missing. And when your family shows up in no other records, they will show up in these land records. And there are other benefits too, like the 1891 tax digest shows your ancestor paid a tax as an organ grinder. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the, which of these, how many of these records are online? It all very much depends. Um, 
Ancestry has a lot of the Georgia tax rec, uh, later Georgia tax records online, but not all of them, but a lot of them, particularly for around 1890 when the census is completely gone. Um, and sometimes some of the deeds and other rec related records are also online. Family Search, which is the free Mormon site, you click on there a location. You go to their collections, you click on a location. They have all these county records on microfilm where the county officials allowed them, I mean, not a microfilm scan, where the county officials allowed them to scan them on the site for the public's use. Of course, many of them are not indexed, but they now have a new experimental program where they're going back and trying to index these county records that they've scanned. And that's already available on their site as an experiment. I've already found great things on it, and you will too. Thank <music> you.